Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm David. Um, I've done some work on reflection in Idris together with Edwin Brady. Uh, before I get talking about uh, the details of it, I'd like to ex come with an exhortation to you, which is that you should control your programming language. Nobody else should be able to sort of impose a language on you. Um, and the language that I've been interested in controlling in the last little while is Idris. And for those who don't know what it is, uh, it's very much like Agda. It has full dependent types, um, also many Haskell-like features, including things like type classes and do notation and that sort of thing. Unlike Haskell, it has pervasive type-driven overloading because when you're doing dependently typed programming, you end up making a million different kinds of index lists and it's nice to use square brackets for all of them. Um, additionally, like GHC, it's defined by elaboration into a much, much simpler core language, which has a lot of advantages because when we want to add a new feature to the language um, or tweak the unification algorithm or something like that, then we only need to rely on our core type checker and not on the correctness of these extensions, which is nice. Um, so one of the things you might want to do when you control your programming language is to extend your compiler with new features. If you're working in a language in which totality is expected, um, then you're going to have a conservative totality checker. So here's an example of the, a function that's very much like quicksort. Um, and we see here that it takes a list of natural numbers and produces a new one, according to the typical almost quicksort algorithm you see in functional programming literature everywhere. However, when I ask Idris whether or not it can tell that that's total, it says no. And the reason it says no is because it doesn't know that filter creates shorter lists, or at least not longer lists. And luckily, uh, some nice folks at Chalmers have come up with an excellent technique for encoding general recursion in type theory by giving a data type that represents the call structure of the function. And then you can define the function by structural recursion over that data type. And then showing that that data type is then inhabited for all potential arguments consists of a totality argument for that function, which can be separated from the actual implementation, which is nice. So um, this. Uh, pile of metaprogramming code at the bottom here has done just that. If I ask it for the uh, accessibility predicate for this QS, we see that we get back a data type which encodes the call structure in the constructors. Um, and additionally, we've then d defined uh, a version of QS, which is called creatively QS prime, which is structurally recursive over that. And when we ask Idris whether or not QS prime is total, then it says yes. And because we're doing this as a compiler feature, I can then rewrite my code a little bit, and I don't have to go rewrite all of the things that are using it. So now, when I ask for, um, the definition of QS prime, I get back a version in which I do have this singleton x in the list. So that, that's very nice. Um, we, can, we can extend our compiler with new features without having to get our hands dirty, uh, actually sort of rebuilding the compiler from scratch. Furthermore, um, in a language which is designed for interactive construction of programs together with its users, we may want to delegate some further task to users. Note that I did not actually prove that uh, QS ACK was inhabited for all possible arguments. So here, I can spit out a, an improved version, which is called QS total, uh, sorry. And we see that that is recognized as total. Uh, its type is uh, the one that we would expect. And when we print the definition of it, we see that it simply calls this auxiliary QS proof, which is left as an obligation for the user. And that obligation can be solved using the standard kinds of tools that we expect when we're working with this sort of language. Right? We can do sort of case splitting and ask for a little bit of proof search and that sort of thing. So we're, we don't have to do everything in the meta program, just the boring parts. So how does this all work? Well, inside of Idris, we've got the high-level Idris language designed for the convenient use by humans. We have this core language, which is uh, about as boring of an implementation of type theory as you can get, uh, which is on purpose in order to keep it as simple as possible. And this is just called TT. And then there's also a bunch of compiler backends that we are not going to care about today, because this is all about the elaboration process. 
So what the elaborator is doing, um, for those who are playing dependent types bingo, uh, here's Vex. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I stole that joke from someone at Tidy. Don't give me credit for it. <laughs> But we played lots of dependent types bingo there. So we have, uh, we have this vector append operation where we see that the length of the result is the sum of the length of the inputs. And it, if I were writing this by hand, I would put parentheses around this because I don't expect that humans know as much about precedence rules as Idris does. But Idris printed it for me, so that's how it is. But if I look at it in TT, we see that it's become a lot longer. So, <laughs> so for example, all of the arguments are named. We, all of the implicit arguments have become explicit. The type class resolution has found a dictionary and inserted it. Um, in our pattern match clauses, each, uh, each match declares the type of all of the pattern variables ahead of time, and so on and so forth. So some of the challenges that arise when converting this append into the more complicated append in the core language include things like type inference, because we don't want to have to annotate the types of all of these things. We also have things like implicit arguments. So append takes all these lengths and the type arguments. Cons is taking the length and hiding it behind the scenes. Um, type class resolution has to happen, right? We need to find our dictionary. Uh, we need to be able to disambiguate the different notions of cons and nil that arise and know that we're in the vect one rather than the list one. And a key observation is that all of these are interdependent. Right? By, by doing type class resolution, we may discover the value of an implicit argument. By doing that, we may allow further types to be inferred, which may allow us to resolve more type classes, and so on and so forth. So the way that this is structured in Idris is that we actually have a sort of internalized proof monad. So it's, it's written in Haskell, and we've got this sort of state and error monad. And the state consists of a partial program or proof, depending on what goggles you're wearing at the moment. And it's got holes in it. And one of those holes is focused. There's also a collection of open unification problems, because sometimes, as we're elaborating, we don't know yet whether or not things will unify. And then there's a, a, a hole queue, which can direct sort of further use of elaboration. Once we've solved this hole, what do we do next? Where do we focus? And there's some other stuff like a name supply, which isn't that interesting for today's talk. Then there's actions in this elaborator monad, which have the form of tactics, which look very much like the kinds of things that you may have seen in LTAC. So we've got things like intros, which wraps the currently focused hole in a lambda if its hole is a pi type. We've got fill, which takes a term and places it into a hole. We've got focus, which moves the focus to some other hole. Claim, which creates a new hole visible at the focused hole. Uh, resolve type class, which, uh, which takes a hole which represents a type class dictionary and then does some logic programming to figure out what fits there. Um, search, which attempts to solve the current hole using things like the constructors of data types or hints that you've given it, and that sort of thing. Search is what happened when I had it fill out that special argument for me on the, or the, the hole for me on the previous slide. Um, so when we're doing metaprogramming independent types, there's sort of three traditional approaches that have been used. The first is to take type theory and shove part of it down its own throat, forcing it to eat itself. And this is a great approach because we get verified metaprogramming within our type theory. However, it has the downside that it's really hard. It's, it's very complicated. So if we want to write interesting metaprograms, we better be prepared to invest hours and hours and hours of work. Um, Additionally, we have various kinds of tactic languages, which are sort of external domain-specific languages, like LTAC or ML originally, which are used to construct proof terms, um, but not actually to be the proof terms themselves. Unfortunately, here we have very poor chances to reuse code from our programming language in our tactic system. Um, and also, if we use internal, like various sort of internalized tactic languages, like something like MTAC, there, we, the type system may get in our way. Like, what if we just want to do something hideously ugly in our metaprogram and then justify it later by it passing the type checker? No good. Um, finally, there's the approach that was taken in earlier versions of Idris and Agda, where we would take an expression in the type theory, say, the goal we're trying to prove, and reify it into a data type, do whatever we want with that, and then uh, splice it back in, and then send it off to the type checker. The downside of this is that you end up having to re-implement lots of the compiler in the language itself. For example, unification. And so in the long run, this is a, also a massive amount of work because you need to keep these things in sync with the main implementation. So elaborator reflection instead 
is the approach to directly expose the primitives of whatever elaboration mechanism we're using. In the case of Idris, it's these tactics to metaprograms, allowing them to make use of the things that the compiler author is already using, because those things are useful. So when Idris is going to do a little bit of reflection on itself, it, it does so now with a type called elab. And so elab of A represents a computation which runs in the elaborator, potentially returning, returning something of type A. Just as IO of A is a type which runs in the runtime system, potentially returning a result of type A. And then we have a bit of syntax in order to trigger these computations to be run, which is this percent run elab, because things that are magical in Idris typically begin with a percent. And elab supports all of the ordinary control structures that we would expect. So it's, it's a functor, it's applicative, it's a monad, it's got alternative, which is used for backtracking and failure handling. And we can use this for a lot of interesting things. So one thing we might want to do is to automate the construction of programs from scratch. So a, a very, very simple bit of automation that really isn't worth the characters that we used to type it is to automate the construction of constructors of the unit type. So what auto here is a computation that returns nothing interesting. So this unit has really no connection to this unit. And what it does is it fills the current hole using exact with a quoted unit constructor. So backtick here means quote. And the colon here is a type annotation to allow the elaborator to elaborate the quoted term using the right disambiguation. Then if our goal is the unit type, we can run a lab auto to fill in the unit constructor. Clearly, this is not a very fun metaprogram. Luckily, because we're in a lab, we have access to more interesting effects. And we can look up what our goal type is. So if the goal type, then, is the unit type, we do just as we did on the previous slide. However, if the goal type is a product, then, we can first make a new hole corresponding to each projection of the product of the constructor for the product, and then fill in that constructor with references to these holes. So here, tilde is an anti-quotation operator. We then focus on the hole A and use auto recursively, and focus on the hole B and use auto recursively. And now we can fill out goals like a pair of units, or nested pairs of units. Did I count my parens right? I don't think I did. Oh. <laughs> Not every data type is a product. Some of them are sums. So if we have an either, here we can first try to fill it out using the left hand possibility. And if the left injection doesn't work, well, then we can fail. And we, we handle that failure using the uh, less than pipe greater than that Idris and Haskell users are very big fans of. And then we create a, a new hole and go down the right-hand side instead. And now we can satisfy goals like this one, where void is the empty type rather than the unit type as it is in some languages. Um, but really, I don't want to have to sort of encode all of my data types, right? I want some sort of more, more general thing. So I can use, uh, I can write a much better auto, which first normalizes the goal using, using compute. Um, attack is a, a bit of scope management stuff, which we need to do when binding a variable. Then, in case our goal is a pi type, we introduce as many lambdas as possible. Then, get env, we can see, is uh, something which returns the current environment. So it gives us back a list of pairs of names and um, binding, the thing that bound them. And then we pull out the names. Then, in each of these names, we attempt to rewrite the goal using that name. Um, this will rewrite from left to right if it's an equality type or fail otherwise, which is why we have the try. Then we attempt to solve the current goal using a any arbitrary hypothesis, and if that fails, then we use Idris's proof search. And this solve is paired up with attack to manage the scope introduced by the lambdas. This is much more fun. And another metaprogram which can use that auto, which is called mush, in honor of a much more capable tactic you may be familiar with in another system, uh, we'll, we'll first uh, introduce a single variable, uh, remembering what its name is, then introduce all the rest. Um, then it'll do induction, where induction is a program written entirely using elaborator reflection that first goes off and generates an elimination principle for the data type in question, and then uh, does some unification with the goal to figure out how to invoke that eliminator, and returns a collection of new holes corresponding to the parts, uh, to the, to the parts of, the of the inductive argument. And in each of those holes, it runs auto, 
And this is a very simple metaprogram, but because we're able to use so much handy stuff from the compiler, we can actually solve a lot of the things from the Idris standard library just using that. For example, we can show that addition of natural numbers is associative. We can show that zero is a right identity of addition. We can show that we can move a successor from the left to the right. We can uh, multiply by one on the left and the right-hand side and get an identity. We can show that addition and multiplication have this nice canceling relationship, that anything to the first power is itself, that mapping anything over a list preserves its length, that appending two lists gives you back one that's as long as the sum of the, of the lengths of the input lists, and that appending the empty list to any list gives you back the same list. Um, all of that just by saying run a lab mush. So even simple metaprograms can actually get you out of a lot of tedium. Another thing we may want to do is actually reuse the facilities of our compiler to compile our own languages or to elaborate our own languages. So here's a very simple skeleton of what could be uh, an embedded language. And its type tracks the number of free variables in the term. So, a variable, so the V constructor should be a, the Brown index that's bounded by the number of free variables. Application doesn't change the number. Lambda gives us one more variable. Uh, and then we have constant integers and also embedded quoted address terms, which means that we can add any primitive we want to our language without having to tweak this data type or any of its interpretations. Then, in order to elaborate this language, we can take an assignment of names to all of the free variables in a term and a term with that many free variables and do some things, not returning anything, but building the term as we go in the elaborator. And so the first step is to take our variable, look up the name we've assigned to that de Brown index, and use it. In the case of a lambda, we need to generate a fresh name for the argument, uh, introduce that name, and then elaborate the body in the context which is extended. Uh, to do a constant integer, we use quote, and so quote is a type class that goes out and knows how to quote things into the core language. To do an application is where the benefit of reusing the elaboration mechanism really becomes seen. So the first thing that we do is we create two holes, one for each of the types involved in the application. Because note that I haven't actually said much about types yet. And in the case of, uh, of the function, we create a hole which is t1 arrow t2. In the case of the argument, we create something a hole of type t1. We then fill the current hole with the function hole applied to the argument hole, and then elaborate the function in the argument. Note that I never put anything in T1 and T2. That's because Idris's elaborator keeps track of these dependencies and fills them out using unification as it goes. And if it gets to the end and there's remaining holes, it'll just fail. And finally, if we have a quoted Idris term, we can just use it. So an example function written in the uh, delightful syntax of this embedded language is a two-argument function which uses Idris's primitive addition of arbitrary size integers applied to the both of the arguments. And I can, I can elaborate that into a context expecting something of type integer, arrow, integer, arrow, integer by invoking elablang with runelab. And then if I say compiled of one with a bunch of zeros and four, then I get one, uh, many zeros, and a four, as we expect. And if I print the definition of compiled, we see that we get back a lambda term. The argument names here are actually different behind the scenes. So I submit to you that elaborator reflection has the good sides of tactic scripts. It's, it allows us to support things like partiality and other effects, um, backtracking control structures, and automated tracking of dependencies between holes. But it also has the good sides of the other kind of reflection with, where we are kicking around reified expressions, because we get a stick in our programming language, and we get our ordinary evaluation model for our metaprograms. So we have one language to rule them all, where type theory gives us a language for specifications and the programs. We have uh, elaborator reflection giving us the same language also to extend our compiler. And we get code reuse across three stages, elaboration, then type checking, and then execution. So when writing your next proof assistant, share your tools with your users. Um, you know, encoding them as effects allows us to easily reuse parts of the compiler without having to put in a lot of complicated engineering work. And you can try it today in Idris, and also in Agda, because they've adopted a similar model now. Um, thank you very much. Questions? <laughs>
Gorgordi, um, is there any staging restriction here, or can you define these elaborator using meta programs in the same module where you then use them? You can define them in the same module, but there is an implicit staging restriction because if your meta program uses a piece of code that has not yet been generated by another meta program, then it'll go wrong. And you get back an error saying that I tried to use this thing and it's not ready yet. So actually, in order to do that kind of thing, you need to understand a little bit about Idris's elaboration order. I'd like to fix that by separating the bindings from elaboration time from the bindings uh, at type check and runtime the way is, that's done in Racket's module system, but I haven't made that happen yet. Um, Gabriel Scherer, I'm sorry to ask the boring question, but about performance. So hmm. it's easy when you do too much in your language to have something that is a bit too slow as a result. Mm -hmm. And the question is, uh, is it actually fine or are you working on a Idris? Oh, sorry. Is it actually fine or are you working on a Idris profiler right now? <laughs> so I am not working on a profiler right now, but it's not entirely fine. Um, performance of elaborator reflection could be better, but it's good enough to do a lot of useful things. Um, hi, Joachim Philadelphia. Um, you showed the code for QS Prime, and I saw a nonlinear pattern there, and I was confused if that's really the code or if it's just misrepresentation of internal variables that are different but had the same age name. I will go back to that one and show you. So, in So if we look at the type here, we see that it takes a list, and then it takes a specific instance of, of it for this list. Oh, was it the H's? Yeah. Those are separate, yeah. That's, that's an instance of the pretty printer not showing the difference between machine-defined names. So in Emacs, I can hover them and see a tooltip which tells me the difference, but I haven't put that in slides yet. Uh, hi, Mike Varenzinius from the University of Birmingham. Um, so your elaborator seems pretty complex. Um, it has backtracking search, it has tactics. Is there ever a case where I write a what to me would seem like a perfectly good program that fails to compile not because it's type incorrect, but because it fails to elaborate? So I don't want to take credit for Edwin's elaborator, um, first off. But, uh, okay. So there, there have been cases where there are programs that seem to be right but don't elaborate. And it's a matter of the, the, the point of the elaborator is to give as nice of a high level syntax as possible. And the definition of the language really is given by its elaboration into the core language. So there's not a good way to say this should elaborate other than this does elaborate, which is one of the downsides of definition by elaboration which could be solved by giving a, a specific semantics to the high-level language first, as is done in Haskell, but. Simon Peyton Jones, Microsoft. Um, so the, the, uh, I'm struck by the way in which your elaboration language, ha it has this sort of backtracking search aspect to it, and that's, um, that contrasts with the, what I call the French school of elaboration, which is to walk over your program syntax tree and generate constraints, hmm. and then solve the constraints separately, which might involve you know, lots of going to and fro and unifying here and learning a bit there. It's very non-directional, um, but that somehow seems a bit incompatible with backtracking. It's as if you've got a particular solve order wired in. Do you think the two are compatible? Could you take you know, the French approach to uh, elaboration and combine it with what you've shown? I think that, it, that you could reflect that kind of elaborator. It would give you a different reflected elaboration language than the one that we have here. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think it would look something like being able to define, to have, to emit constraints as effects, basically, or emit pairs of constraints and evidence-producing functions, depending on exactly what you're doing. There you go. We should do that. That would be cool. I think kind of you already have, right? <laughs> okay. Thank you again. Thanks. Adapter or no, I don't mean, great.